Welcome to uh, Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and with me here on the show is uh, Michael Graves. Thanks for having uh, me back, John. Yeah. And uh, well, a little bit about me, and then that'll only take like half the show. No. Uh, and then uh, Michael will, will uh, chat a little bit about himself, and then we'll get into the topics that uh, uh, today's show I've, uh, I've, I've uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek called it government government ineptitude show and dopey joe's free pass in the lamestream media so uh michael tell, tell us a little bit about how you came to libertarianism if that's a thing and, yes uh, yeah yeah it's a bit of a long story but um in essence yeah if we want to kind of go way way back uh you know I grew up in Davis, California, which is oh. a uh, very left-wing, oh, yes. left wing, left-leaning uh, town community. People's um, Republic of Davis. Mm -hmm, yep. And, uh, but I come from sort of a, a more conservative or Republican family. Um, and so that was just a very you know, interesting environment to grow up in because um, when I was growing up, you know, that's war on terror, uh, George Bush Jr. You know, kind of era. And so we had these um, overseas wars that, you know, my family being Republicans, they were, they were pro-war. Mm. Um, and then I was going to school with all these people who were, to their credit, violently anti-war. Mm. And I sort of, you know, had to take all this in, you know, in my formative years. And then as we kind of learned, you know, later on, it became obvious to everybody that uh, the, the lefties had a point right. on that one. Right. Right. Um, and so I sort of became, you know, more of like a, an anti-war conservative. Mm. Um, and was really just disillusioned with the whole, the whole thing, the entire political landscape. Um, and then I sort of, you know, in 2008, I was aware of the uh, Ron Paul campaign mm -hmm. uh, for president, but I sort of, um, I, I actually voted for Obama in the, uh, in the general. It was my first vote oh, for president. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, you know, I still think that was a pretty defensible uh, position to take because I wanted the wars to end, and he was the anti-war uh, candidate and you know how did um, that work out for you? Well, you know this, it's interesting because I have to make the concession that he was better than someone else might have been. He's probably better than George W. Bush mm -hmm. as a concrete example. But at the same time, I don't give him a lot of credit for being the anti-war guy when all the wars are still ongoing. Well, mm -hmm. not all of them now. Afghanistan has finally ended. That wasn't even under Obama. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of that was kind of the process, and then we'll get to you know 2012. Um, I was really kind of like all in uh, for Ron Paul and the 2012 uh, Ron Paul's 2012 campaign, um, insofar as as I was interested in these things at all. And I went, I you know I volunteered for Ron's campaign um, at the call center in Chinatown. Uh, then you know we kind of get to the Trump era, and um, that was that was interesting because I I could see from the outset that that wasn't really. You know, the, the Ron Paul stuff, it, Ron Paul people, it, so, to a certain extent, been run out of town. And mm. the Donald Trump thing, while very interesting, was not going anywhere that, that I could support. Mm. Um, so I, I figured that out pretty early. And so, you know, against all odds, Donald Trump was elected, uh, and which cer certainly surprised me. Um, and then so following which, you know, I, I couldn't even pretend to be a, a Republican mm. anymore. Um, and so when we get to uh, more recently 2020 and the, you know, the COVID lockdowns and all that, that was kind of when I uh, came, um, having been a philosophically a libertarian for a very long time at that point, um, I came and got involved in um, LP politics. And that's where you are now. That's where I am now, yeah, well, um, at for large for LP Sacramento. Uh, yeah. Thanks for being on the show. I'm, I'm um, a libertarian, uh, but not actively involved in LP. And I came to it through objectivism, uh, through Ayn Rand. Right. Uh, I won't say how many years ago, but I was 15, and uh, so a lot of years, less than 100, and more than 30. Uh, <laughs> and um, you know, I used to jokingly uh, chat. Richard Fields uh, uh, produced the show for years and years, and 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 I identified at the time when I was talking to him as a Goldwater Republican. But uh, half that that was just to poke Richard, and, uh, and then <laughs> since then I've appeared on the show, I don't know, 50 times, 100 times, whatever. Yeah. And, and anybody that, uh, I think, anybody that can, you know, that human beings um, are, are weird. They, they don't want to, uh, oh, a little aside, 
uh, I late in life had a, a labor of love job uh, raising money for a uh, as a development officer for a uh, um, public interest law firm, Pacific Legal Foundation, that uh, right. helped um, um, people of, of this wonderful nation by by holding the government's feet to the fire as it violated the Constitution of the United States, and that's just not federal government, but that's all the myriad unconstitutional independent regulatory agencies, which are a much greater threat than the elected folks. Right. And so um, now I'm here. You know, my, my books uh, definitely reflect a uh, – uh, libertarian, anti-government, anti-regulation, anti-corruption uh, uh, bent. And I think we've taken up too much of this show talking about ourselves. Let's talk about <laughs> government ineptitude. And I'm going to talk about it. You know, we have a tendency when, w when we do this show to talk about doom and gloom. But I'm, I'm going to try to put a little bit of different spin on this. I don't know if you folks are aware, but, uh, well, anybody that lives in California, but for our thousands of viewers in the rest of the country and overseas, um, we we have uh, way too many dead trees in California, right. and um, well, way too many trees. And the uh, the government and the left and the ecologists have uh, said that this is all due to um, global warming and um, horrible forestry practices. But what it that was actually due to was uh, fringe uh, environmentalists preventing. Um, the, the government from doing a actually a very good multiple use plan that the the uh, uh, federal government put together believe it or not over a hundred years ago and mm -hmm. that was that uh, people would use national forests you know you could uh, graze your cattle there and you could hunt and fish and uh, they would use commercial limited commercial logging to thin the forest to prevent fires and suppress fires that was the plan right. And what they did, instead of doing that, was uh, limit access to the forest, suppress fires, but not allow, uh, especially recently, um, thinning of the forest. And the, yep. the reason they did this primarily was be because of the uh, radical environmentalists uh, uh, stopping them from doing that and then blaming global warming on the fires that they created by stopping them from doing that so that they could institute ever more draconian laws to uh, try to fight global warming. And right. um, then it's, it's funny, the guy in the story, I don't know if I'm going to mention his name, I don't want to get sued, but there's a wonderful, it's actually a pretty good B article, um, which is a strange saying pretty good and B article. Uh -huh, yeah. And the, that pretty good B article, I don't know if I've, how many times I've said those four words together, but not often. Um, finally, um, the the, um, the the fella that that was used by I think Earth First and Forest Forever and Sierra Club to stop the logging uh, that would have and stop uh, preventive burning and all the things that would have thinned the forests to, not to the extent that they were when John Muir walked through them he he talked about the Sierra Nevada and the the forests inviting openness. And the clown mm. that, uh, that stopped all this um, it has a Ph.D. in ecology, not forestry. I think it's from, I don't know where it's from. But he, he, his theory was that <clears throat> dense forests provide a windbreak um, um, so, right. that, so, that, uh, so that fires can't actually get going. And the shade caused by these dense forests uh, makes a cooler environment so the... So the um, the fires can't get going. And finally, mainstream forestry folks said enough of this. Your science is loony. Uh, it doesn't hold water. But judges uh, mm. in this country are want to listen to radical environmentalism and do what they say. But finally, there's some pushback, and they're starting to do some things that they should have done 75 years ago. So that's the good news, that that this fringe science, and I don't even want to call it science, that the radical environmentalists use to stop logical, wonderful things like nuclear power, is now being pushed back and questioned. And I think that's wonderful. Give me your take on it. Well, I, I just told you, I grew up in the state of California, and you know I think the wildfires have gotten quite a bit worse mm -hmm. um, over the past, say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One uh, might simply be 
that the population has gone up. So, I mean, we did have, you know, there have kind of always been wildfires here, but, um, uh, you know, th th there's just more people, so, mm -hmm. so they're more impacted. You know, in Paradise, California burned down. It's kind of like, well, you know, in a previous era, that, that town really wouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, well, they had to, they had to put, put the houses somewhere, and they just mm -hmm. put it kind of close to this, um, uh, you know, national forest, and, and it lit up. Uh, so that, that's part of it, but I think um, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. What, what I see here is very poor and, and unfortunately uh, deteriorating um, public stewardship of the of the public land. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, it's like you said, there are accepted um, forestry techniques and you can do controlled burns. And I think in the past, um, you know, state of California would, you know, the forestry service would do that um, and just for whatever reason I, I guess it's you know captured by these um, environmentalist interests uh, they have you know stopped doing that and and then not not just the control burns but the, the thinning I mean if you get yeah, to right. the, log, yeah. allowing logging I yeah. mean, that's, if you get uh, to the point where there's six feet of fuel on the fire you can't really do a control burn because it's uncontrollable <laughs> right, so right. the only thing you can do is go in and take these nifty machines they have and thin the forest out. pull that stuff out and sell it pull yeah. it out turn it into uh, mulch, <clears throat> turn it into fiberboard, turn it into something useful, and uh, you know that's why these people are in business, and they have the technology to do it, they have the capability to do it. They're scientists. There is forest science. They understand how to uh, turn out, um, uh, how to create wonderful forests. If you want to see the difference in, uh, you can, folks, the, to our thousands of, of viewers. Uh, you can look at all sorts of pictures of the great fires and you'll see public lands burning uh, in wild infernos and privately managed lands with private fire departments putting out the fires, mm -hmm. um, uh, having way fewer trees on them, unlike what the environmentalists say that, the, that these, these, uh, um, these forests that, the, that logging companies maintain are unnatural and, and unhealthy and all the rest of that, but they don't burn. So the ones that are turned well, into turned into tinder boxes burn. Well, the problem is there are people living in this state, mm -hmm. and um, I, I think you're totally right. They, there's sort of this fetishization of you know just uh, what would this place be like if there just were absolutely uh, no people here. But this just isn't isn't the reality. Mm -hmm. It's not an appropriate way to manage the land. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, if there are no people here, then the fires would have burned, and we would have never got. To and this we, we, no place. one would care. It, yeah. you know, well, it, and it, but it wouldn't have got to this place because the people are the ones that suppressed the the right. the, the fires and didn't thin the forest. The Native Americans used to set fires constantly to get rid of all of this fuel and waste. One of the reasons why why the Sierra Nevada. But we got some other things to cover, and we're we're as usual. I'm talking too much. So let's <laughs> let's can we move on to the next point where you have some expertise? Yeah, and that's tariffs. And there's a, uh, we, we quote reason here all the time, folks. And if you <laughs> want to support an organization, there's a reason to support reason because they're reasonable and they use reason. They're, they're relatively they're good. Yeah. It's, yeah. Still yeah. have a soft spot in my heart for Reason Magazine. Yeah. Um, so th this article is about um, the impact of tariffs and I think specifically the, um, the sort of Trump era punitive tariffs on. People's Republic of China, products of China, mm. um, and some of the impacts that it's having. And they specifically point out a couple of uh, you know examples where there's there's just obvious you know, bad effects from this where okay there's safety equipment for swimming pools that's historically been imported from China and then we we slap this very high tariff on it and now they're just you know now there's it's harder to procure <coughs> safety equipment for your swimming pool in the US and obviously that's going to lead to bad consequences per perhaps some deaths and drownings um, and there's really no reason for it um, you know what? What this goes back to is, you know, Trump. Trump comes in and he says, uh, you know, it's the the head of the federal government. He's going to be a tough guy, and this is going to be great because China has been taking advantage of uh, United States in trade relations. And while they've done some unsavory things, you know, it's it's hard to make the argument that that's been, you know, all to our disadvantage. If it was to our disadvantage to buy from China, we wouldn't be. Uh, doing it, we, you yeah. know, Americans buy from China because it's cheaper, mm. um, and there's savings, and, and it makes Americans richer to have lower prices. Mm. Well, um, I, I want to interject a little bit different there. The, there's, there's, and I'll go back to environmentalism and overregulation uh -huh, and all yeah. the rest of that. What we do as a people here is blissfully talk about being green and loving the environment, and we export pollution to other countries. Oh yeah, and sure. We export. Uh, 
folks in the factories in China, these are dorm factories, these are people who move from the farms to factories in China, yes. work from nine to nine, six days a week. And then they go back home on holidays. The 200 plus million Chinese on holidays go back to their home village. They were in the fields, now with more efficient uh, agriculture, they're not. But, but you know, if you make it impossible for, for people to produce things, especially here in California, to have a factory that produces things, then what you're gonna do is have those things produced somewhere else. So there's, you know, this is not just, it's, it's, sure. it's not a one-way street. The it's people that are street, complaining about all of this stuff are the ones that created this mess, and then, and then adding tariffs on top of it made it even worse. Well, you, you, yeah. you have two different um, phenomena here. You know, but yeah, there's, there's certainly a pollution issue in China, and they would have higher prices if they handled that, and they really, they really ought to do that. I do business in China. I've imported products from China for, for quite a while now, and um, it, it's a serious problem. You know, I have problems even you know, visiting Beijing because the air pollution is so mm -hmm. bad. There's serious pollution of the rivers and waterways. Um, and that really ought to be addressed. It's bad for the people mm -hmm. over there. And it's sort of, you know, it's not well, something I can address. It's their business to, to handle that. It's going to drive their prices up, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, in people in Korea, many people in Korea are, 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 are firmly convinced that pollution in China has changed their weather. Ooh, so, yeah. um, and they're, they're building, uh, what, a new coal-powered plant uh, about every week while they uh, claim that they're going to get to somehow net zero in carbon. Okay, well, don't worry yeah. about that. But the, the yeah. um, you know, the, the bottom line is China is industrializing, yeah. you know, in, in fits and starts, and it's, you know, it's certainly complicated, but um, uh, their standard of living has been increasing, oh, no, I, and that's a, that's a blessing. You know, yeah. they, were, yeah. they were living under a, a communist or socialist regime for decades, um, and now things have liberalized, and this is, you know, a lot of this is very beneficial. And you know, the, yeah, the wages have been going up, and I think this should be this should be cheered. And yes, they're burning some, you know, quite a bit of coal mm -hmm. in the process. But that's just that's what happens when mm -hmm. people's standard of living goes up. You know, I, do, I don't want all these people over there to, to be in de well, you know, destitute. Bring, let's bring it back um, to the let's bring it back to the tariffs again. So right. t tariffs, ba basically, the way Let I understand it, and you have a little more expertise than I uh -huh, do, that, yeah. that all t tariffs do is make uh, consumers. Uh, pay uh, more for products and protect um, uh, commercial people who provide the same products and they, they create an artificial inequity in the market. Is that pretty close? Yeah, that's a close um, uh, understanding of how it works. You know, there's probably two things. So I've worked as an importer, mm -hmm. and so there's, there's probably two things I draw your attention to. One, the whole system is pretty absurd, even, even if it's not too bad. Uh, even when when it's not bad, uh, it is really pretty outrageous. You know, in order to import any product, you have to go as an importer um, and find it on a list of all of the possible products that could be imported to the United States. Right? It's called the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, mm -hmm. and every product has a tariff code, and it's like a 99 chapter document with 50 or 100 pages per chapter, and you have to go find um, your product on the list so you can declare it to Customs and Border Protection so you can make sure that, you know, you know they want to know it's, you know, a good product to import and all that stuff, but then you got to find, oh, you know, it's a 6.5% tariff or not a 3.7% tariff or this one's tariff-free. And, you know, people have to spend their time, me, I have to spend my time digging through this stuff. You know, it's really stupid because it's like that's one of the reasons I'm able to do that job is because, well, someone's got to be employed finding the correct tariff code. Mm. But um, that's literally that is the way the system works. Mm. Um, now. A 6.5% general tariff, which is what we have in the United States, is not very high in the scheme of things, and the average tariff amount is significantly lower than 6.5%, because that's the default amount. Um, there's a lot of exceptions. Some of them are zero, some of them are you know, two, some of them you import from a nation we li really like, like Israel or you know, whoever. Um, you have you know, ex you know, extra favored Russia. nation stat, yeah, not, not anymore Russia, but um, you know, and they'll, they'll have, you know, it's a 2% tariff for them, or one and a half, or whatever, right? Um, that's the kind of system. What's going on with these China tariffs that's so sort of offensive to me is, um, yeah, they're, in, they're putting up large trade barriers. Uh, Donald Trump came in and said, you know, yeah, we're really going to we're going to stick it to China. Our, our, you know, it's like our largest trade partner. Mm. And um, everybody's largest trade partner. Everybody, but, but mm -hmm. certainly the yeah. U.S. And so we put a plus 25 percent punitive tariff on many, many, many products of China. Not all, he left some exceptions in there. There's certain things that would be you know, politically 
mm -hmm. um, bad for him to you know mm -hmm. kick the price up like that. But a lot of these things he says, well, um, the, the tariff used to be six and a half percent. Now it's thirty one and a half. Marco, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I appreciate your expertise on this. We've got a couple other other uh, things to cover, and I'm going to be n not the time Nazi because that's a terrible word, <laughs> but I'm going to be the, the kind of the stopwatch guy. Sounds can you, good. Can yeah. you wrap it up so we can move on to uh, uh, something else that looks horrible but might actually represent something yeah. good? The, the bottom line with tariffs is a 31.5% tariff is really excessive, and what you're doing is you're making prices uh, from China more expensive for consumers in the U.S. And specifically, the people who are hit the hardest, of course, are poor people who shop. You know, where's all the stuff at that's, Walmart come that's from? That's what I was waiting is China. for you to say. Yeah. yeah, and so these people are the ones impacted by this tax, so that you can either look, well, you can either pay 30 percent, you know, or 25 percent extra to buy this product from China, or you can buy it from a more expensive. Uh, it's not even necessarily a U.S. producer. It could just be some other country that's more, uh, more, more expensive, yeah, more yeah, favored. Yeah. Um, and then you're you're taking that you know um, economic opportunity out of the hands of the lowest cost producer in China. I just don't agree with it. Okay, and and that makes absolute sense. Uh, I don't think as a libertarian anybody anybody who has a libertarian bent would would probably agree with me when I say that we 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 shouldn't. Uh, uh, we shouldn't interfere with the wonderfully exactly. efficient flow of goods and services and capital, and everybody should compete on a level playing field. Now, and, yeah. and you have no right to get between, to interfere in the dealings of a voluntary, willing buyer and seller. I don't care which two countries they're in. Does it make sense for, uh, you know, if I'm here in Sacramento and I want to buy a product manufactured in Cincinnati, would there be a moral basis for the government to come in and say, sorry, um, Cincinnati is not on our most favored list. You got to pay 20 more percent, right? They're well, just people no, in another part of the world. How no, does this in, make any sense? In California, uh, I think Ohio is not on the bad boy list, but maybe from maybe <laughs> Florida is starting to Miss, be. Mississippi, yeah, to. you can't do business with. All right, let's talk okay. about something that at first, uh, and for the people in Sri Lanka, it sounds horrible. Sri Lanka right now is suffering from, it's a gorgeous country. It's a beautiful country with hardworking people, and until recently, had lots of tourism. There, there's lots of things to see, um, and it had farmers producing and exporting and all the rest of that. And then, um, shocker, uh, a government came in and borrowed way too much money, uh, and from the Chinese. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's whoever will lend it to you, you'll take, uh, yep. and couldn't make their loans. And uh, oh, okay. then, hmm? yeah. and then um, they decided, out of the blue, that uh, with very little notice, all of these small farms that that in Sri Lanka relied upon fertilizers uh, to produce crops, to produce crops for export, mm -hmm. to produce crops to feed people. And overnight, they said, you may no longer use anything but organic farming. Overnight, bang, the state they did that. Provided. And so not only is the economy falling apart, but uh, they can't produce food and all the rest of this. But the good news about Yeesh. it is, is that an article that, thank you, an article that uh, uh, talked about the horrors of this was actually in the New York Times. So I think, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I want to not be the doom and gloom, uh, doom scrolling libertarian that talks about horrors. The fact that even the New York even Times, the Times is reporting on this. realizes that uh, suddenly from one day to the next, telling farmers that uh, they can't use fertilizers and now you have to uh, go Well, all the organic. Times makes the sack be yeah. like a paragon of journalism, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to I'm going to do that one. And then uh, I think if you don't mind, we've got about five minutes left. I'd okay. like to talk a little bit about the Hunter Biden story. And right. uh, I want to talk about it in in the specific and in um, and in general, as the New York Times uh, suppressed uh, during the election campaign. Not that I wanted Trump to win, but I didn't want Biden to win. And it's well, kind of like totally regardless uh, of that. It's, it's like I wanted I wanted none of the above. Regardless of that, you're talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story. Yeah, yeah. That, oh yeah, and that that was suppressed. Um, it's this weird like corporatist thing where there's been like capture of certain organizations by political ideology, and they're not even government organizations, but literally Twitter censored 
right? Um, true, truthful journalism, right? There were, there were journalistic articles about this, not in the Times, they, they weren't gonna touch that, right? But, um, but it was out there, and then people were, okay, we're gonna share this thing because we think it's you know, true. Maybe you might not agree, you know, sometimes not all the articles turn out to be true, but the, you know, they're sharing it on Twitter, and Twitter says, oh, we're, it's our response, the, the company, Twitter, they said it's our responsibility to make sure that misinformation is not shared on our platform, mm -hmm. so they, they literally censored all mention mm -hmm. of this, and you know, it was like a month before the election or something. Well, they did it leading up to the election, they did it before the election. And that means and you can't, yeah. as a, as a yeah. general rule, that, that's poisoning the ability of the electorate to vet the candidate. Mm. So, so that the conclusion, it's just the wrong in general. Yeah, the only conclusion you could have is that our supposed uh, objective free press is neither objective nor free and, <laughs> and had a great deal to do with the outcome of the election. And what has come out since is um, really some disgusting stuff. Yeah, it's and been some wild. Pretty obvious corruption. I mean, the the latest thing is that Hunter Biden, with no skill whatsoever, uh, is suddenly selling his art to people for hundreds of thousands of dollars a copy, and you cannot find out who the buyer is. And where is this invisible cash going to? It reminds me, kind of, yeah. sort of like the Clinton Foundation. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so uh, let's hope that, uh, uh, you know, the gray lady, uh, the New York Times, who seems to uh, take the bit in her mouth and run it's with all very this craziness. Similar. It's very yeah. similar to the Clinton Foundation where yeah. you, you yeah. can see where the money, you know, you might not know who it's coming from, but you know there's money coming in. It's kind of like, well, why is this money being donated by these kind of like suspect? Um, well, you have no idea who they are. In this case, you don't. I think yeah. in the case of the Clinton Foundation, there were oh, some did. examples. You did. I think there were examples. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's kind of like, oh, but there's, you know, there's a, they're paying them for this service, and the the the, the price is just absolutely um, outrageous. And it's kind of like, okay, well, I, you know, I don't have like a smoking gun for corruption, but this looks really, really weird. Mm. And no, I, I don't know I'd that say, I, as yeah. a, you know, yeah. a citizen, you know, looking evaluating the Clintons or the Bidens. Uh, need a smoking gun to mm -hmm. look at this and say, look, it, lo it smells like corruption. I don't need to prove yeah, it. it. It's walks um, like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's no, it's a just duck. outrageous. It, yeah. Um, no. uh, so that the good thing is that finally this is stuff is getting in mainstream media. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now, right. of course, after the election, when it could have tipped the scales, and then uh, to add on to this, there's of course the stuff about. Uh, Trump being um, uh, in cahoots with the Soviets during the last election, <laughs> and which was basically made up of, out of whole cloth, but was trumpeted by these same main mainstream media yep. organizations as if it were the truth. And so you have uh, the people who are supposed to give us information uh, actually creating information and shoving it down our throats. And I think that note, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. You can catch us on uh, YouTube. Simply do a search. You can catch us on Ac Access Sacramento at uh, 8 p.m. on Thursday. That's the live show. I think 4 o'clock Saturday morning. That's my favorite time to watch. And there's one other time where we're on Access Sacramento. Thanks again. Yep. Thanks, thank John. You very it's been much, a lot of fun. Michael, um, it was a blast. We want to really thank Access Sacramento it. and thank you all for watching.